Okay, so today is July 18th, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinction Nadi. And our agenda for today, it looks like we'd like to discuss about um, our meeting with Faulty. Is that correct? And we have a few suggestions from Gary. So how, how, do you, how would you like to start this? We have to deal with faulty. Um, I don't think my suggestion was very interesting, so we might have to pass on that. Just uh, unless Hugh wants to go into it. Um, what? What was it? Sorry, I'm, I can't remember what it was. It was about the uh, the eternal battle between the shaman and the uh, and the priests which I had put in different words um, uh, as a result of the, that video. The two, the two things that what you had with the LaRouche discussion um, uh, and they talked about uh, something that alerted me to this sort of long-running battle throughout history between the, the mystics and alchemists and on one side and the the sort of uh um reptilians on the other side and then in that um uh, uh that was in the the farm podcast and in the, the larouche discussion they seemed to touch on the similar thing which was the um uh uh the the the, the this sort of globalist agenda was um, trying to um, sabotage the form, was trying to stop nation states from forming peaceful alliances. Um, I'm not explaining that very well, but I somehow felt that they were the same, that at some basic level it was the same battle going on. Um, but anyway, we can talk about that later. Yeah. If you want to deal with faulty, we'll get rid of yeah, faulty so first. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, uh, was that a suggestion related to faulty? No, no, that's not related to faulty. No, no, it's not related to faulty. So oh, we should okay. do that first to yeah. get it out of the way. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not explaining well, uh, it very well. Yeah, I agree. We could well, talk about. Well, faulty. maybe we should get back to faulty when we've burnt we've burnt a bit more real here. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking about what yeah. Gary said there and about his suggestions there for today. Is that you know, there's so much intense rich material on this sub like videos that you post you mostly you but there's it goes in so many directions and we nearly need a talk after each post <laughs> because well, you know that yeah. a week goes by and then we've got this amazing thing and this amazing thing and, and it's just a nearly impossible to keep track of all this poo fireworks of things you know but yeah, faulty. Let's see. I was thinking for faulty. What I suggested is that we needed to to see about you know the last time you coached us and want to know a little bit what direction we're going there for the next uh, hmm. you know line of attack. Well, to, I, I don't know to be honest. Apart for the next one, so uh, we 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 have to answer answer the questions that he asked, and I. I think I mentioned what I was going to say to those things. Um, but, you know, the, he's asking, you know, well, who who makes those decisions and who's, just, you know, that was one of the, the questions. And, you know, what's the decision-making process? And I'm saying, like, well, I'm, you know, I, what I want to say is that, like, it's him. He's the cult leader. It's so it works kind of like a general. You we can all be influencers, we can all give him counsel, we can all rail and moan and swear, 
um, before the decision is made, but like a general in an army, at some point, he gives his decision, then everybody has to, you know, drop their ego and try and make his decision work. And no matter if, if, if it seems completely stupid to you, it just means you have to work, work harder to make it work, but you, you don't do the egotistical thing and then saying, like, I don't agree with this. And then you, don't, you, you, so you have to say that he's absolutely the decision maker and then everybody else, uh, you know, most advisors or the power behind the throne or sort of Eminon's Greece or something. But, you know, it just influences everybody. It would be a team of influencers, including us. But he's the absolute decision maker. That's the one thing that the left can't do. And they come up with, with all this nonsense about, well, we can't have leaders because they just take out the leaders. Well, this is the point of an arc is that you absolutely squeaky clean. They can't take out the leader because the leader hasn't done anything wrong. And if you get famous enough and they do take out the leader, that could be the end of them. So there's protection in the fact that, you know, one of the reasons why Faulty is perfect for this is he's a, he seems to me, I hope I'm not wrong, but he seems to me to be a very squeaky clean guy with uh, without many skeletons in the hot in the closet hopefully and so he's he's a very pure soul and so it's he's perfect for this because you don't get many pure souls in this very dirty game i mean just just look at the activists around them all of them are tainted they've taken money from places they shouldn't they you know they 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 not very saintly and he's he's kind of like a martyr figure so he's perfect for this and then He's got the advantage of being in one country that he can use as a safe base and then focus on operations in another country. And so he's got the, the benefit of a national boundary. And so it's, it seems to work wonderfully to, from, from what I can see. Um, and then, yeah, the other question, has anybody got any comments on that? Yeah, yes, sure, if you don't mind. Uh, one of the articles that you linked to, and I can't find the name of it now, it did a kind of a detailed exploration of Gail Bradbrook's background. Um, it was in a few different parts. Um, and I had a quick look, but I, it didn't look as though that the, the person who had done that had done an exploration into, into Faulty. Do you know if that was done or not? Uh, so is that Corey Morningstar? Um, no, Corey Morningstar was mentioned in that article as having done uh, Greta Thunberg, the thing on Greta Thunberg. Yeah. But this, what was, I think it was in the Unlimited Hangout or or Nowhere News from Nowhere or something. Yeah, and 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 it uh, uh, the part two of it, I think, or or another part of it from the one you linked was all about Gail Bradbrook's background. Um, and I was curious to see yeah. if there was any similar thing being done for Faulty, but it, it wasn't immediately obvious. Never so seen I was it. No, Never no, seen no. it. And I, I believe that it hasn't been done because it's not possible to do it. Mm. If you look at the hit from Desite, when, when Desite mm. did that, you know, very yeah, sneaky yeah. hit job on him, and basically got him kicked out yeah. of Germany, which was obviously yeah. what it was intended to do. Um, mm. The... Um, the Germany. Fact that they did, yeah, uh, desire. I mean, desire. It means the time, right? It's like it's uh, a, yeah. TikTok man virtually came and basically kicked out Mr. Chaos. Is what what happened huh. there. So, so anyway, the Harlequin went to Germany, and then basically the TikTok man got his number. And the way that the fact that the TikTok man had to do that setup to basically just have to get some. You know, they just so obviously led him towards a landmine and then used it. Uh, and then obviously the, the plants in, in, you know, in that neck of the woods in the, in the movement itself that, that carried through. So yeah, just the flavor of that means that if they had to sink that low to, to make a hit, it means that he must be really squeaky clean. Because it, it would be, it's so much easier for them to, you know, just find the odd, you know, choir boy with a sore ass or <laughs> some rape victim woman or, you know, sexual abuse in the in the movement or drugs or, and, and like, they must have been come up with a blank on that to, to actually go <laughs> stoop so low. 
So I took it as a very good sign. But anyway, what it means is, I think, you know, that kind of personality is bulletproof. I mean, you know, how many politicians do you know that you could pass scrutiny? You just, you can't make it in politics unless you're a scumbag. I mean, you, you, I mean, literally, it, it's like to be in the in crowd, you have to be a, a scoundrel. You know, they, they won't, they won't invite you to their parties unless you are kind of a shit like them. So you, you know, no politician can can make it. You know, it's like you, you get so, somebody like AOC and stuff, and yeah, yeah, sure, she's you know, but like she ain't gonna last. You know, squeaky clean, not a chance. Now, what, about, what about the trip? Um, well, I, I mean, I think we just have to feel our way towards oh, that because, you know, it, I feel like there's such a lot uh, to to teach him just about the whole ethos, the landscape, you know, the opportunity now with with the Great Reset and such a clearly defined enemy as the transhumanists and, you know, it's... It's just a perfect time, but it's going to take a while to to educate them on all of that kind of stuff. It goes kind of deep, doesn't it? So, yeah, but should um, we should Thursday? Would you? I know you're going to probably reiterate your invitation, um, so that would be part of the. Would that be part of the talk too? To to try to 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 to, to entice him and to to make the the trip. Uh, I'll try. I'll try, but I still think that, that he's got to be in his comfort zone and he has to lead. We just have to keep on, you know, being the blushing damsel and stuff. And, Should we remain yeah. as silent as we were the last, the first time? Because, I mean, I don't well, know. Well, this, this is not quite the same thing. Yeah. We, we've, we've kind of made the sale already. Yeah. So I think we're kind of in a different regime now. But I'm not really sure what regime we're in. We, well, okay, I think what we're doing now is we just, you know, warming up, right? He did, yeah. uh, I, I recall that he said something towards the end of that last discussion that uh, nobody else had had a chance to say anything or something yeah. like that. So he was expecting us to, to be, well, I mean, I suppose because, you know, obviously all of the other calls that he participates in, everybody would want to be asking a question or jumping in, you know, so we might have looked a bit unusual by, by saying nothing. Oh, so, so what about this then? Do you feel comfortable in, in leading now? Everybody just leads and pitches in. Do you think that would work? No, I don't, certainly oh. not. I, I could have a question. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I think there's too much chance. I think there's too much chance we'll stuff up your grand plan, in, inadvertent, with the best of intentions, and inadvertently, with, with, Hugh is yeah. probably going to be throwing up his hands in horror. <laughs> what if we What if we raise our hand? Uh, my training from grade school raise our hand and then type a comment in the chat and then if it's a worthy of uh, presenting to faulty lord you can read it or well i i think you should just raise your hand and not type it in because okay. because uh, yet yeah, uh, my problem is that having a look at it, it it's distracting it, it kind of breaks the conversation because you have to go breaks to the, the flow, comments yeah. and then i I haven't got my glasses on, so I have to read it real close and go, uh, okay, yeah, i got to get back to the conversation. So it's, it would be much better if you raised your hand and spoke. Yeah. I wonder if that did that kind of, you think, um, uh, freaked him out, that we were all just silent um, except for Lord Hugh? It might have, yeah. That's, we should... Yeah, we should liven yeah. up. Is it going to be recorded or not? Yeah. Ah, so the, because no. the first oh. no, no, right? Is it recorded no, or not? No, we okay. it's not recorded. No. Yeah, so, so I think we take yeah, notes. So. so we take minutes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I think. Yeah, I think at this stage, really, we have to just allow him to do an inspection. So he's he's got to feel comfortable, you know, walk around, poke around. Um, yeah, I think we're just taking him around the car lot, lot and showing him the upholstery and stuff, right? The best of it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the... the, the, the it's this all good. Is... In this showroom... There's only fucking Rolls Royces and Lamborghinis. And I mean green ones, but... <laughs> yeah. Um, but what were you saying, Gary? Uh, I, I, I think a lot of what we're on about is, is rather fundamental stuff that c can be a bit shocking for people to to just confront directly I, I mean this the, the two things i think which stand out are the kind of spiritual thing the 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 um this whole idea of the alien cortex dominated uh individual and society and also the other big idea is is this idea of of what your what we're ultimately looking at, which is to to bring down global industrial civilization, to to uh, leave a bit of a chance for whatever's left to carry on. You know, I mean, they're, they're the bottom lines, um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, you know, how is it a bit of a risk just to sort of dump that in his lap? <laughs> You know, or do you have to? Um, no, it's a to... it's a huge risk. I don't think we can we can go there because, mm. yeah, I think, I think basically needs a bit of distillation to to come to that that conclusion. I I mean that's one of the reasons why I would like a bit of you know, a little take him off and to sell him the timeshare kind of thing because, um, you know, it's quite a big. Thing to swallow, and I I could do with some help from people like Derek Jensen and Leah Keith, and people that might explain it, so, and you know, Max Wilbert and stuff, and say you know like uh, he needs. I don't think he hears those voices. I don't think those voices exist in Britain because there's not enough wilderness left. And so uh, I think nature's pretty far removed from Britain. You know, I mean, the, uh, when when you say all the all the naturalists I talk see, there's like, oh, they're all going to save the new you know new forest from the Newbury bypass and stuff, and it's all about badgers and you know stuff, and it's like, no, it's not quite what we we're talking about. Yeah, it's like kind of like saving the oceans, and it's, uh, uh, but but anyway, the I, I don't think we even really need to go there because. One of the things that uh, I want to try and convince him of is that, you know, the whole problem of what the movement is trying to do is too abstract. So it's like Naomi Klein and that says, it's like the polar bears just don't do it for me. And that's true about most people. But the weird thing is, and the value of a cult is, that people will do anything for the cult. So, you you know, the cult's aims might be something abstract and quite cerebral, quite intellectual, like climate change. But not many people get a visceral reaction from climate change, especially in Britain, I, I can see that it's all rather abstract. And But you can see people in the movement, right? Dealing with people in the movement you can see they will do anything for the movement itself. They almost don't care. It's almost like climate change, just an excuse. Half of them don't believe in climate change before 2100. It, the movement itself is a cult. And that's that's the, the point of a cult, is that if you want to do something like get 300 arrests or 3,000 arrests or something like that, uh, people will do it for the cult, for the movement, for their comrades. They will do it. Not many people will do it. You will never get 
3,000 people together for the polar bears. It's just not going to happen. Because the polar bears, are they only see them in National Geographic things, you know, somewhere behind David Attenborough's shoulder. And so all you're dealing with there is the mammalian brain, and all you've got is cute, and cute disappears as soon as the picture of the polar bear's gone. So when you're sitting in the fucking road facing a police line, there's no polar bears there, and your mammalian brain is completely switched off. So but they have to do a lot of, you know, singing mammalian brain stuff. But it's it's like you've got to get past all that and say, you know, you can't have an abstract goal. You've got to just say, make a cult. Then, then as the cult leader, you can make them do anything. They're virtually Manchurian candidates. But I think that, by the way, uh, Forty seems to me quite a sensitive and, as you said, a, a kind of charismatic type of guy. Um, uh, Max Gilbert had agreed to, to meet with him at some stage. So maybe at, at some stage of the interview on Thursday, we could we could ask him, would he be interested in talking with an activist who who is uh, really, uh, you know, American and who could, might give us a, an idea of how things work out out there, you know, sort of present it that way, because it wouldn't be difficult, I'd say, to organize it with Max once uh, we could set a date. Uh, it can be a you know follow up of our meeting. I kind of see it as a whole curriculum. So I see it's kind of like you know educating Rita or doing um, you know Pygmalion, and so we we line everybody up for each one of these classes. So the people I've been talking to, um, you know, even uh, this this new guy Alan. And the uh, you know Lionel Snell and uh, and all of these guys are just I I see them as I'm kind of grooming them on the assumption that they can fill in you know one subject in the curriculum, but to go from a lifetime of complete horseshit, um, complete garbage in terms of activism. And just throw it out. Uh, you know, it's going to take a little while, <laughs> a, a to get to that point. I think we can get to that point, but then then we're going to have to start from scratch and just you know slowly reimagine a new world. And I, I, it's going to take time. And so we need to sell that idea that it's worth it. But yeah, I I, I can definitely see me losing my cool about you know this current campaign in the autumn, which is just. So insane! I just yeah. I'm speechless. Mm. Yeah, Hugh, he's he's also got a major task. Um, even supposing he swallows you hook, line, and sinker, he's got to go back and deal with all all the people that he's associating with, and do the same thing. With yes, them. and that's one of the things we need to talk about. But you see, there's mm. there's so many sacred cows to shoot down on in left wing activism and. The, these guys will not admit that they've been utterly useless for the last 50 years. They've been utterly useless, utterly ineffective. And so they, they have to give up, but they won't give up on all these sacred cows. One of the sacred cows is its numbers. We need to appeal to people. We need, you know, the, the big battalions on our side. And you're saying, no, that's completely wrong. Any strategist from Sun Tzu to uh, Klaus, uh, Klausowicz, I mean, uh, yeah, um, will will tell you that it's quality. You better you have to start with a small cadre of quality, and that becomes the seed crystal that you can grow. If you have the core that's solid, the numbers come easy. So yeah, all these people. If you have, if you have a look at the you know Gene Sharp and that, it's all about Erica Chenoweth, three point five percent, all of this stuff. It's horseshit. Absolute worship. Look what happened with the Arab Spring, uh, where they followed Gene Sharp's thing to the to the law, to the letter of the law. And what what happened was the more organized, smaller kernel of radicals, normally Islamic, they took over. So basically, you had your Velvet Revolution, and then Gene Sharp's crowd didn't know what to do after that. There was no formula after that. The the formula is. Well, then you have a liberal democracy. The IMF comes in and makes you, you know, starts raping your country and giving you debt. And that, that's Gene Sharp's 
aim. That was the State Department's aim. It's basically you get rid of the dictator, you put a liberal democracy in, you get the country completely in debt, and then it's, you know, colonized. And Gene Sharp was an, was an instrument for doing that. And it backfired in the, in the Arab Spring because there were, there were Islamic fundamentalists that were organized, prepared, and they were ready. And as soon as the dirty work was done by all the, you know, nonviolent action, they swept in and took uh, holds of the instruments of power. So they took the ins institutions very quickly. And so if, if the left ever gets anywhere, they don't have a command structure. They don't have any way. They're not prepared to take over institutions and hold them. Well, so I think all, you know, hold on to this example for our conversation of Thursday, because that would be... We're not going to turn a liberal, well, not a liberal, but nearly into an anarchist overnight. But these sort of things, he doesn't hear that sort of thing. Faulty does not, does not. Yeah. And I think that's very important. That, that's it. It's, 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 they're, they're in this echo chamber where they tell each other all this yeah. nonviolent stuff. is like, oh, violence never works. And horseshit, absolute lies. You can show it again and again that it's, yeah. it's, it's crap. You, you, you couldn't... You know, it's it's not worth flushing down the toilet with this crap that goes on in these these circles and stuff. And so, it's it's basically. But uh, the good thing is that Faulty is at the point where he's desperate. He realizes all this shit doesn't work, and so we have to show him the the new way. But the new way is, you know, the cult. He's in charge. He's a cult leader, and we can explain how to do all that. Then the other thing he the other question he asked is. Is you know um, who who basically does the game plans and does you know designs the game and stuff and so uh, thinking that that we try and get all these people you know the the dibs you know um, the the latitude society and uh, you know did um, the mega store. Um, and stuff like that. All, there's so many of these art groups, you know, um, Meow Wolf and stuff like that. There, there's so many potential people. I mean, there's there's a sub on Reddit called ARG Writers, and they're people writing ARGs. And, you know, anybody that, that writes an ARG is normally an artist, writer, creative type. And, and those people are automatically on the left wing. So, you know, it's just basically... Uh, recruiting those guys to do design their game, you know, but um, yeah, I think yeah, so, and very then, you know, in puppet master. I think by what he he said the last time and his reply, I think he's 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 very taken by the idea of arc, and I think he's like a lot of people, like myself, like a lot of people who don't know about them, are going to be intrigued and and it will be uh, very interesting to answer his questions on that. I think. I think he's taken by the idea. Yeah, but, yeah. I think that was something. It's funny, like Leo. Yeah, I, I do too, because he's desperate, right? Yeah. Mm. Here, I but, think. But, um, yeah. I, I'm just thinking. At some stage, you're probably going to have. To, it's, it seems obvious, just from my slender little view, that that he's, you know, spending an enormous amount of time and he's organising and going around the place and all the rest of it. At some stage, he's going to have to stop wasting his time doing that and put that time into what we're talking about. Um, and it, I think it could be worth suggesting that to him at some stage, that if he really is interested in, in this and, and wants it to work, he's really going to have to devote himself to it for quite some time. And it's going to mean leaving all those things that currently define his existence. I think he's very immersed. You can even see the, the time delay to get the second meeting with him. You know, and in that time, you get that video like the one he had on a few days ago where he's sitting in Hampton Heath there reading something out. And I'm looking at that video of him sitting there and thinking, you know, like you're wasting your... Roger, you're just, this is frivolous. It's ridiculous. You're just sitting there reading some fucking litany of, of doom and, and, and wasting your abilities and and time which we don't have much of um you know he's he's got to have a turnaround in where he's investing his his um his time i think it, it just looks to me that this that you know he's a valuable person that's just been thrown away 
Yeah, I think maybe that's what we should set as the goal for the meeting, to convince him of that, that he needs to get out of the echo chamber. And so that's the thing that I was saying about having getting over this numbers thing. It's also implied that let's get something started and then bring on people as necessary, not lead with the, you know, the, the existing people that he's surrounded with. Because the existing people are, you know, it's very much, you know, new wine into old wineskins. And so, you know, forget the old wineskins, maybe bring them on later when you understand this and you've got something established so that they have to fit in. Because I think it's, it, it's, it's not really going to work if you bring all these people that bring all their baggage. And I, I can see that the people there that <clears throat> are, they have poison, they're absolutely poison to the movement because they're nostalgic for things like freedom riders and stuff. Those, the old guard, the, the elders of the failed left are absolutely poisonous because their their heads filled with this romanticism, all these echoes for we we shall overcome, and all these romantic ideals that they they want to recreate this past era, that and those old glories are gone. We're in the digital age. We're about to be digitized out of crap by by Klaus Schwab. I think that's what and he wants. It to doesn't hear. work in the online world. I think he wants to hear that. He wants to hear what you're saying, Hugh, about the old guard, the toxicity of of this uh, this attitude and uh, in those in those circles uh, that he's around it's quite <laughs> popular that people go on retreats and you know sort of get away and that's maybe could be brought on by maybe you want to withdraw from you know and just question the strategy and what would be better for that than uh, to just go with people who are totally just go on a boat for example or yeah, you know yeah. and just you know, yeah, that, basically, that's your ayahuasca trip. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's your ayahuasca trip right there. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, we, we, I think that's what we need to sell is an idea, you know, the thing that it's, well, that's always been what we've been trying to say. It's, it's, it's time for a, a big reset of our own and a great reset of our own. And, and, and he knows that. He's right for it. He's, he's said so many times that all the old stuff doesn't work. We've got to think entirely new. He says that at the beginning of every video and then launches into the old stuff again. <laughs> it's like, what's wrong with this broken record? You just said it doesn't work. And then you go straight back to it like a dog to its shit. Just maybe, dog that to its be, maybe that should be pointed out to him. Maybe he doesn't realize that, that he is just uh, regurgitating all tactics that don't work despite his theoretical knowledge, that, you know, or his factual observation it's not working and the other thing too is in the interview he he um, he admitted that it was like he was um um over 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 um um like his decision like it was a decision of the other co-founder not to go a different way something like that like he was overvoted or i don't know what the word would be yeah, and then then they all have regrets, including the person that made that decision. Yeah, yeah. but we need so, to tap into his frustrations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but you the, know, the, the thing is that you just give him, hang on, like that. Yeah. But I think the thing is, the, is, is that we, we have a solution. So we, we can, you know, safely. Um, knock down these sacred cows because we have replacements one for one. It's just a matter of giving the time to understand them. But yeah, um, I, I mean, it ha there's a definite point where I think people get to where they, they have an epiphany. They say, oh, now I get it. What, what this whole thing is. Until then, people are, ah, oh, this odd concept and how does it work? And but it's, it's baffling and stuff. And, and you know, at, at some point you go, oh, I've, I've got it. I so, finally see how this works. And uh, just communicating the idea that there is this tipping point to understanding. It's, um, it's, it's, you know, uh, well, for example, in the, in the email, it's like, okay, what's the path to action? <laughs> like, no, it's you're putting the cart before the horse. You build up the egregore. 
you build up the cult. You basically, you know, something like, for example, if you wanted 300 arrests, right, or, th you, or say you wanted 3,000 arrests, you wouldn't build up to that, right? You would, because it's very fraught with danger trying to build up to the 3,000. Because, okay, if you start with 300, you have to, you know, uh, the next iteration has to improve on that. And if you don't improve, it'll fizzle and die. And it's very easy for the opposition to see you coming because you, you're stepping slowly towards this goal. They're not going to let you do it unopposed, and they're very, very clever. And so, you know, when you start getting your 300, they will start doing everything they can to belittle you, to make it look like this is unsexy, to pull the rug out from under you. So if you go from 300 and the next one is 100, they've won. Because you're not building up something romantic. Everybody would say, well, that show's over. They, nobody will get on that bandwagon. So you, I don't think you can build a bandwagon that way, going from, well, we'll do 300 arrests this time. And then next time, we'll get to 1,000. And then when we get to 3.5% of the population, magic happens. It's like, no, it's, that plan will never work. But the way it works with the cult is you, you would build it up. You build the ethos. You build it. If you say your plan is you want 3,000 arrests, I mean, it's a batch of crazy but plan. But all right, you're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and, but then, you know, you, you, you would build up to that. You would, you would invent this idea that, oh, there's the day of the storm. And then, you know, people would practice with the day of the storm. And it would become, you would ritualize it and pray to it and make idols to it. And everybody would have the day of the storm. And then, you know, and you would say, you'd get to a point where people were like, when's the day of the storm going to come? We've been going over this and over this. And then you know, people get to the point where they're like, we want to go into battle. We want to get arrested. And then, and then finally, the government does something irredeemably stupid, which they're going to do. And then you unleash it. But, you know, you, you just basically prepare, 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 and then strike when the moment. But you see, that's other ways. What's the path to action? As if you set the agenda. The left always thought that they set the agenda. No, it's crap battle tactics. It's just utterly but inane. But these 300 arrests have names, have people uh, who will be, uh, if they're arrested in jail for nothing, we know that, it's not going to do anything. So has, has anybody pointed to, to, to Faulty that this is, I mean, just doesn't he see, can't he see that he's putting some people on the line or in the open instead of on the ground and that he is he's going to compromise a lot? Do you know he's why he's they're, throwing they're, they're his resources away yeah they're, they're in denial you can see that they've they're out of ammunition they just basically um they they're just trying to uh just do a hail mary pass kind of thing and so they're really just just going through the motion so it's going to go off like a dance it's and, so where it the is, they know it un underneath i think you would they, understand they, they that. must know it in their heart of heart but I think he would he would understand that disregard for these people that um, are are going to be encouraged to to do useless actions with no consequences, in danger of maybe their physical uh, health, maybe their mental health, and maybe their future prospects of whatever they want to do, or and waste time and money in in the in Her Majesty's jails and courts. And I mean, for what? And he doesn't. I mean, has anybody ever? Uh, that's the point I, I made. It, that's the point I was trying to make at, at last, maybe the last time we had this discussion, was that he's throwing away his resources. I mean, those people who are in prison are no longer any use to him, as well as them being there. That reduces the number of people that he's got who can work with him. So that makes getting getting your numbers back even harder again. And all of the people who who waste money paying fines that that. that you know, all I've got to do is sit for five minutes and think, hey, if I go to a protest and get fined a thousand pounds, and I'm fairly certain that that's definitely going to happen, you're better off not going to the protest and giving giving Faulty a thousand pounds to help him get something else going. Uh, you know, he's the, the whole, he, he's just going in for a kind of a cannon fodder exercise with the, the thing yeah, that's this, going on. This, at the one of the. 
one of the opening lines, I think, in Sun Chu and Art of War is saying that the, the first thing is, you know, the, the bad general seeks out a battle. Mm. A good general trying to avoid it. And then the, the second thing is that the bad general is not parsimonious with the men and troops, with the troops and material. And so yeah, but basically that's what's happening in this case. It's, well, it's basically that, that's been, that was troops are being thrown in without regard to the yeah. consequences. That's precisely Sun Tzu that was in my mind when I said that, because it's one of the, the first, mm. one of the first basic things that you know a good, a good general will do is just he will, he will care for every one of his, of his men. Not, he will not just waste any. Yeah, um, especially yeah, but it's also the, true of if, like, side, you, you know, supposedly the first rule of any rebel is to stay alive. But you know, the the second and third rules will be the second one is well, don't be in jail, and and three is is don't waste your your any money or resources that you've got because they've got to go to the cause. And I mean, he's in contradiction of the whole three. It's just yeah. But I actually it's, wanted to it's make it another. Like it, well, it's going to be like Reynard the Fox, right? Reynard the Fox is, you, you're supposed to be, you know, you since you, uh, it's an asymmetric warfare and you're the weaker party, then you have to use wit. So you, we don't have anything on our side uh, in terms of the big battalions or firepower like the wolf. And so, you, you know, it means you, you have to be clever like a fox and use the uh, other resources against them. And that this, this is not using resources. The, the, the state can put up any amount of resources to try people. You can't fill up the courts that way. They, they, in, in the past, when people tried to do this with the Lollards and the Renters and stuff, they just put all thousand of them. You just basically put a thousand of them in the dock and try them all together. You can try them in absentia. They'll put them on Skype and then say, you know, like, well, there are 10,000 people here and, you know, try them all together, put them in a detention camp. It's like you're not going to fill up the jails. It's infantile. It's it's complete misreading of Gandhi and Satyagraha. It's like you will not fill up the j jails. It doesn't work like that. You, you, yeah, you can put stress like on them now because they're underfunded. But, like, they'll fix that. Mm. If you if, – if it's just a cost-benefit equation. The cost of, you know, putting on more courts and putting on more judges and stuff, there's a cost to that. Well, it just so happens that you didn't actually make an expense that justifies that cost. So they don't make courts bigger. But if you actually make headway and you do cost them, well, then they're going to defray that cost by making the courts fucking extreme and the jails pretty hairy. So, you know, just get over this idea that it's a static target. These guys, these guys are going to move, and they're already moving with the, with the police and crimes bill. So the police and crimes bill is going to be out before uh, uh, autumn, and you don't know damn well what's going to happen. They're going to use exemplary justice against the, the, the organizers, and they will have the public on their side because it's stupid. It's stupid. Everybody will see it's stupid. You look like an idiot and you'll get what you deserve. And the sun will have that as a fucking headline. So just think it through for fuck's sake, guys. This is the stupidest thing known to man. So, you know, so if you scrap the problem, basically the left has to say, whatever they're good at, it's not strategy. So just give up the strategy to somebody that knows what they're fucking doing. At, at some stage, all of this is going to have to be communicated to him um and you know i'm just one i mean it's a terribly risky thing to be doing but, you know a, a, this this particular discussion we've ha had now um is you know at some stage is it just going to be worth leaking it sort of so that he no, can wait, actually wait, just wait, sit that, and watch why I'm, i don't mind it being recorded yeah, I, you see, I don't mind it being recorded like this because it's mm. almost advantageous if mm. somebody actually saw it and brought it to his attention. Yeah. If somebody yeah. said, hey, you know, these guys are not on the level. Just have a look at this. And then he mm. would watch this and say, oh, no, actually, these guys are on the level. I need to talk to these guys. So, you know, it's, it's yeah. kind of bringing – it's I, kind I, of – we win either – I just put a comment saying that maybe we shouldn't put this video up before Thursday, uh, before the meeting on Thursday. 
Yeah, well, yeah. I don't know. I, 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 well, I the thing is, you know, I thought it's not hard to imagine. This one, but this one, I think, yeah, I think we've made the sale now. So, so I, I think if if he heard this one, it wouldn't be bad. We're speaking from the heart, and we're saying, you know, I I would say what I'm saying now to his face. The only thing I would not say is maybe in the same tone. But in terms of content, uh, I would want all this information conveyed. Yeah, but we're at the early stage, and I was wondering if it's not, you know, the, the time. So, so, I don't know. Yeah. It's debatable. I um, yeah, it's very difficult to know, because look what we're looking at. If, if my analysis is right, and you know, faulty goes forward for 10 years in jail, just shock treatment. They're very likely to do that, to be absolutely draconian, just to send a message. They, they have a history of it. And so, they, you know, that's what the bill says. They Virtually, it's, you know, exemplary punishment to deter people from doing this kind of civil disobedience. So, it, it's, so if that happens, it's a disaster. I don't know, you know, can you imagine the chill? They, they're setting themselves up. I mean, if, if I was doing a PSYOPs, right, if I was a state operative doing a PSYOPs, I would set the situation up. I, I, would, I would get a hold of Faulty or somebody like him, and I would set him up as an actor, and I'd say, look, we'll give you a million bucks. Just, just you be the fall guy, take a big sentence of 10 years. It'll put a complete chill over everybody. When but, all of this is passed, you'll get pardoned. But, but, but you know, you, this is a secret for us. That's probably time. what's happening. Well, I don't, I don't think it's happening because I don't think it's right. happening because I think that basically faulty is a straight arrow, right? Yeah, but what I mean is that there's some other forces in his movement that, that might be propelling him yeah, under. Well, I didn't want to. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> yeah, but it's, I didn't. I didn't want to go there. But, no, but, but one you of know. the reasons why I want to say, like, to get the numbers, old wine skins and stuff, is like you've been infiltrated. <laughs> he doesn't get it. <laughs> yeah, and um, but you can't say that to him. He 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 won't accept it because. But the, the, I tell you, okay, I'll say it here. Maybe regret it. But, but like whoever came up with that plan in in autumn, if anybody from XR is listening, right, and you're on the right side, find out who came up with that suggestion. Look at their background. There's something fucking wrong there. I mean, seriously, fucking wrong. See what those people hang out in their spare time. See who their pals are. Have a look where they went to college and where their, their pals are. But have a look at may, maybe the gaps in their curriculum and stuff. Because there's something wrong with the cunt that came up with this idea <laughs> in autumn. Look at them. Look at them. Yeah, it's, it's like... Um... It, it's funny because uh, Faulty, like you know, knows a lot of the history. But has he heard like what happened to the Black Panthers? Like the guys in their group that suggested doing violent action were fucking cops. Well, the same happened oh, with CI battle in cells. The, the guys they were agent provocateurs. All those pictures that now CNN plays on a loop whenever there's any riots in Seattle. They are agent provocateurs. You, yeah. Basically, the, the guys breaking windows at the Bank of America and that, they found them. They basically, they have their badge numbers. It's fucking retarded. But I, but go and have a look at the history of Occupy. These, these movements, um, you know, okay, I mean, for fact's sake, Gene Sharp started out funded by DARPA. All the stuff he did, the book, you know, from tyranny to democracy or dictatorship to democracy, all of that, was funded by the fucking State Department. Erica Chenoweth is an agent. She's a freelance agent for this fucking State Department. You took your advice from all these bastards. that <laughs> They work for the IMF, basically. Indirectly, they are agents of the CIA and the IMF. You are an agent of colonialism and oppression. You walked right into it. So anyway, you can't tell that to them because, you know, the pride and stuff gets in the way. But I'm telling you, that's anybody that knows anything knows that they've been compromised. Yeah, it's and like... And right high uh, up, too. Right? 
Yeah, I mean, I think he also needs to be aware that the the Machiavellianism isn't just at the very top of the hierarchy. It's the the middlemen who are just as ruthless and sometimes even worse. Yeah, this uh, the guys are trained, but anyway, the 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 key thing is is nonviolence. So they they basically well, it's it's in that little piece that that we had of the you know how they actually do it, how how they they. Train people, you know, get hold of the the idealists and make them into realists. Get hold of the realists and put them into the university. All of that that strategy is is right there in the playbook. But it all has to be nonviolent because as soon as somebody starts shooting, then it's uh, they'll lose control. And that strategy is very well described in uh, Mark Boy's book, uh, "Drinking Molotov Cocktails with Gandhi." Really, I mean, it's just he, he, he's laid out, his book is mostly uh, references, it's, it's really extracts of all sorts of books that he has compiled, you know, but that is just a, a learning book for anybody who wants to be in a movement or just run, <laughs> run. <laughs> But, but the thing is now we have all the solution. We've been working on all the, the tactics and, and the way around it, and it's a cult and it's an arg. And so, yeah, it's, um, we can put this together. The, the, but, uh, okay, so, so, okay, so we got roughly how we play it, right? And then we'll, we'll play it as um, 40 leads and it just, you know, He's just doing an inspection, gets to his comfort zone, and we just answer answer his questions and may maybe lay into the stupidity of <laughs> water. Is it is it good enough strategy for? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted um, to say, in addition to the the cost benefit um, factor or cost benefit perspective that you had mentioned, and you've already gone through the warnings of the risks that he's taking if um, he gets uh, severely punished and there's a chill on all action now. Uh, but just from the common sense thing of what Gary was kind of saying that from even just from effectiveness, like the return on investment, all the things that they're spending and wasting just from the common sense of that, um, why keep doing something that's not producing results? Uh. Yeah, there's, there's also the flaw. I noticed this flaw where there's not proper accounting. One of the things that alarms me is I spent, you know, all the time that I've done developing this art, I the 80% of that time has been spent on ways to finance it. So it's the financing and all of that kind of thing. And so it alarms me that the the gem of this plan, um, Fawlty's not really interested in. It's just yeah, oh, financing. Yeah, that'll come come through. You know, go fund me and stuff. And say, not in the world that's coming. Now, if if there's a if there's a uh, financial great reset, uh, and then we want, we have e currency. If basically it's a cashless society, well, one of the goals of that is to micromanage spending. So you won't even be able to buy a pack of gum that the IRS or all the alphabet soup agencies don't know about. And not only will they be nudging you, but you know all the activists as well. You, you have to kind of imagine them in an Alison McDowell world where they own a UBI and they don't, they're not free to go and then do rabble rousing and then say, oh, well, we can do full-time activism now. We'll sit on a UBI. No, you fucking won't. What they'll do is they'll micromanage every single thing you do, everything you buy will be done with a nudge. And if you buy, you know, a poster or something like that, and just it's not, not approved, well, then basically you're gonna get punished for that. Basically, they, they will they they will restrict your UBI. They basically they will put you on a personal improvement program. And part of the things where you you will have a minder who will essentially um, be be like your parole officer, and they, they will look. Okay, what did you spend? Your time? Did you spend anything on drugs? Did you spend anything on activism? Did you, you know, buy vegan stuff? Did you do any? And they will look at it and they say, where did? What did you donate to? And you you cannot do activism under that tight control because they will have 
control over every penny you spend. And any any organization that re re relies on a GoFundMe or something, they'll squeeze out all the participants. And that's the world that's coming. So we spent so long, you know, preparing for this world. And then to just have it brushed off as, oh, you know, I'll auction off ponytails or something like that to pay for it. No, no, no you fucking won't. Not in the world that's coming. So, so yeah, so so one of the things that I wanted to say was in the, the, the left is not good at cost-benefit accounting. So every action must be cost-benefit accounted for in terms of the enemy's cost-benefit and your cost-benefit. And one of the big flaws, I think, on the left is they, they're a bit too fast and loose with the members' money, the members' time, money, and stuff. Is everybody supposed to pitch in and you're just supposed to take the hit? As a good soldier, well, you know, it's kind of like we need arrestees, you know, like, well, you go and get arrested and then you get a 6,000 pound fine. Well, you know, they'll help you a little bit until the fund runs out. And then it's kind of like, yeah, well, you put up the rest. So they, they, they milking the members. Uh, they just fast and loose with the members time, money and bodily harm. And that's not going to fly for very long. Uh, you're not going to build numbers that way. So it's, it's flawed, right? to the heart of things. But anyway, we can't get onto this kind of subject in, in this, no, but that's, this sort that's, of meeting. No, but that's, that's tying on to the comment that uh, Gary had put on the on the meeting for today, if we have exhausted uh, the faulty uh, subject, um, which, uh, where he was he was bringing up the, the conflict, the, the problem between with transhumanism. And there's been a lot posted about this recently on the sub. And I was wondering if we wouldn't go there a bit because I mean it's uh, yeah, it's let's, 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 to, uh, yeah. I don't know. Does anybody else want to say something about Thursday? Um, I don't know. Good luck and thank you. <laughs> Are you not going to be there? <laughs> I have a wage slave commitment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Save that money. You're going to need it. Um, I think the uh, the problem with those days, um, <laughs> if anyone goes too far in what they suggest, and we lose him, uh, we we, we want to. I want to be able to blame Lord Hugh <laughs> instead of me. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I'm just a bit because well, you know, I mean, sometimes if, if, if so, if, if so, so, if that happened, I don't know what I'd really do. I mean, I'm kind of giving up on two year project. Um, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I'd probably just have to go off and get a real job because the funds are getting a little bit low. But what I think what, what I would do after that oh, is. I would, I would try and make hay out of it. I, I would try and, you know, show it all up as uh, saying, like, now you want to listen. You see, we told you, we fucking told you, told you, told you, basically, you know, make a big hula about, about exactly what we said and then say, now are you ready to try something new? And then I think a lot of people would, would say, yeah, this was the dumbest <laughs> move we've ever seen in our lives. And it might precipitate um, the, it might be the success of, of the scheme um, by default. You know, we could find somebody else that can pull the role of the cult leader. Um, and yeah, well, that's where there might be, some, it, that's where there might be some hope in, in, people that we don't know anything like um, that we've been copying the emails to uh, Lynn. Well, they, um, for yeah, instance. we could get some like crazy ass guy like what's that guy, Yao Ming? What was that guy? Um, there was this guy who, a very strange guy, he was a Chinese guy and he, he kind of says, you know, like you've got to he was tailor-made to be a cult leader because he was saying, like, you know, you've got to pick me to, like, lead the movement and I'll lead it to victory because I come from a long line of these Chinese ancestors that were basically part of the Boxer Rebellion or something. <laughs> he was talking to Gail Bradbrook, and, of course, it didn't go anywhere because everybody was like, you know, 
it's kind of stalemate. He's saying like, support me and I'll be a great leader. And everybody was like, well, you know, I'm, you're not a great leader until you get people yeah, to support um, you. So it was kind of <laughs> 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 And remember, remember that um, uh, I, I don't see you as a, as, a, as a cult leader, but there was a very positive uh, response to the idea of ARG in deep green resistance. And, um, that movement we don't know. Like we haven't we haven't gone very far with Pierre on that. We had one interview and we she was very taken. Derek has got a, a no, Derek is very uh, is a very pure man too. Um, there's people in America who are who are might be also you know if everything goes to shit, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You I know, mean there must be there must be people that are good for the well in in essence. You just need a good actor. <laughs> it's pure act. It's an act from start to finish. It's just the. If so, only we could yeah. have audition. If only we could have auditions. Um, <laughs> maybe that will be our next. You know, that's not as quality. far fetched as you. It's not as far fetched as you imagine. So that guy. I, you see, I, I really, Spencer McCall and that, I really want to talk to those guys because I, I, I still have not even got past the first layer of that fucking onion. And I know there's a lot in there. But they that guy who's, um, uh, you know, not what's his name um, in the, in Elsewhere, in the, in the Elsewhere ARG, it's um, Lucius, uh, whatever. The main character, the guy who, Oh. Um, you know what I mean? Lucian. Lucian. Uh, yeah, yeah. Lucian Freud? But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no, Lucian yeah, not really. The one in the Institute is the one, is the one that appears first on the, yeah. on the television in the Institute. And at the oh. end of the, at the end, he's kind of becomes a kind yeah. of a guru. Uh, um, oh, you want yeah. this? Yeah, Octavio Esquire. So so Octavio Esquire, he is an actor. They pay he's a paid paid for actor. Now, because he's in some of the stuff that Spencer McCall has done, then he I think he was paid for that. So mm -hmm. that guy is is you know kind of perfect for, for the role. You can pay by the hour. But what, what really interests me is that I think that Octavian guy, what they're hinting at, I think what Spencer is hinting at is that he is actually a real character. I think he is a kind of a, a spoof of um, Jeff Hull, in fact. And so I think there's a lot to Jeff Hull. And I think what they're hinting at is that this Octavian character is Jeff Hull. And so I'm... Um, I, I've long suspected that. I would actually like to maybe mention that when we talk to Spencer again. Yeah, um, but, in the but anyway, it's, society, it's, it's kind of that um, yeah, in the character that um, Ox character is there. Um, it portrayed Jeff Hall. They they clearly showed that that um, there. So there was the Jordy, who was the the traveler, and then there yeah, was Jordy. this other. Um, paranormal character there too which was jeff hall supposed to be jeff hall. yeah so i could see that yeah so but anyway it proves the kind of point that if, if you got funding from you know philanthropists then uh they could you could actually have that role paid for by the hour <laughs> you could just basically audition people in hollywood in, in fact, there's um, so many actors in, in, in Hollywood that I'm pretty sure you'd get somebody to do it for free. Yeah, yeah. It was um, Octavio Coleman. And yeah, the, the Lucian, Eva Lucian was the, the supposed young woman who was gone missing. Eva Lucian. Yeah. And, Eva, and, yeah. and the name of that fellow who was... Uh, doing that facilitation session or whatever it was right at the end. I don't know if I wrote that or not. That's that's Geordie Aitken. We, 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 oh, is we it? Had okay, a, right. An right okay. That's yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's him. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. But, I mean, there must be, I mean, in a world of 8 billion people, 
Well, see, this is uh, this is Lionel's realm of, of somebody who can come in and pretend to be, you know, that whole, the video where he described how he did the um, the, the cult leader thing, you know, um, which was really fascinating, actually. Um, so yeah, he, I mean, he would be a good person to talk. Day, you need a, yeah, at the end of the day, you need like an, you know, an Andy Kaufman who kind of can spin the, spin the Joker kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, but well, that's that's good for that topic, isn't it? So, uh, do you want yeah, to go? So do you want to go on to what? Yeah, did you want to go on to the topic I suggested, or, or is I, I don't know? You didn't sound very interested in it. it. Is it worth pursuing, or? No, no, I am. No, no, I, I just, I just had the thought that we might push the faulty conversation to the end of the, end of the tape. Oh, to the so end of this. We, oh, I see. You know, yes, yes, of course. Yeah, it's an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but right, anyway, we've done, yeah. we've done that section up front. So anybody flying by might might come across it, but it's no harm. I think wouldn't hurt if uh, if faulty actually saw it. But so. Yes, no, no, I'm terribly interested in this subject. <laughs> um, it, so th there's a closing window of opportunity, and it's the, the whole world has been lit up by this Klaus Schwab and stuff. It's so, you know, it's too good to be true, almost. Um, so it's it's so cool to make hay out of, um, because it's it's a blunder of gargantuan proportions on the establishment side to be to be doing this. They 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 have taken a step too far, and with with the whole world sort of, you know, pissed off about the one percent and Davos and elitism and conspiracy th theories flying, and for them to come out with all this bullshit so arrogantly and stuff, it's like they 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 need a taking down. They 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 like. Uh, Aristocrats in the court of Versailles that are completely detached from reality, and so yeah, they yeah, one of one of us is completely detached from reality. Either us little guys or they are. I'm not really sure which. I mean, when I, when I see these big um, super yachts here um, in Greece and the like, guys getting taken off them on helicopters and stuff, and I, I start thinking. You know, we're the fucking deluded ones. These guys have got it done pat. <laughs> and so, like, and then sometimes I think uh, these guys are completely wrong and they're going to be taken down in the sorriest way that people can imagine. But anyway, one, one of us is going to be right. I don't think it's going to, it's going to fall either here or there. It's not going to end amicably. Well, the, the, there's there's always the sort of ultimate window, which is closing, which is the the environmental ecological one, and I mean that's the the, the all this uh, World Economic Forum, Davos, you know, Klaus Schwab thing, it's it's facing, you know, what they want to do, uh, could just be rendered in, completely impossible in a short time frame. Um, so there's there's that way of looking at it too, I guess. Well, well, yeah. This is the thing that we really need to play on, and that's the these guys are so fucking arrogant. I mean, I was just reading you, uh, Yuval Harari's um, Homo Deus and stuff, and you know, he's not really a futurologist, but in, he shares this kind of conceit of how resilient our our civilization is, and it's like. What are you talking about, guys? You, you know, you're a couple of logic bombs or an EMP away from this. That, that's the end of it. Game over. This society is back to the Stone Age, and and they, they they really think because it's so big and it's so complex and it's the size of Rome and you know they say like you'll never bring down the empire. It's like, are you kidding? I could, you know. You, you might get some bio terrorists re release uh, an agent that takes out rubber. And it's over. No more planes, no more wars, <laughs> no, no more anything, no more police transients. The world doesn't work with rubber. There's a strategic material, that you, and the same is true with dozens of things. Glass. The whole, the whole 
everything in the United States, in the whole developed industrial world, China, everything, goes to pieces with glass. Well, glass is only one hiccup in the supply chain on, on LNG. So basically, if, if you had a week, so basically they, every, every glass plant, basically most of them in China, they, they have 72 hours of, emer of emergency fuel. If they run out of that fuel, that's it. The glass will solidify. The basically the burners will go out. If they, the burners are under the glass now, if the burners actually go out, you don't. Know, you have to rebuild the fucking factory from the ground up. It would take another ten years to reconstitute that glass factory. Nothing works without glass. Have a look at a shop store that you you're in next time. And imagine all the products that are now packaged in glass are off the shelves. There's no substitute for them. So imagine everything. Imagine windows and cars and tanks and vehicles and submarines. Can you imagine them done without glass? It's just an unimaginable world. And it's like 72 hours hiccup in, this, in the gas supply chain. And, that, and it's all centralized in these fucking gas exchange hubs and stuff. <laughs> Uh, it's just remarkable how these idiots just say uh, extrapolate the the graph, you know, this kind of infantile, sophomoric, you know, ah, oh, the civilization is heading there. China will become a superpower because just extrapolate the graph, and by 2050, and it's like, really, that's how shallow your analysis is. It's like you, well, you, know you could many, see that you could terrorists in that out that are out there to change the story. <laughs> but you could see that with that ridiculous thing about getting the. Dan making uh, latex for the rubber out of dandelion juice, you know, and uh, you know, but if you, you know can't grow, if you can't grow the rubber, well, that's right. And that, but not only that, you've got to look at it. If you can't fucking grow rubber plants because the ecology's collapsed, then what makes you think you're going to grow dandelions? Like, you know, I, I mean, they might, you know, obviously pretty resilient little bastards, but you know. <laughs> They're, they're just they're merely saying well you haven't you haven't uh you you haven't suddenly stopped relying on the environment to get this rubber you you haven't escaped anything at all um it just well, well but, but it's so vulnerable to ecotone so 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 the thing is that you see anybody that's is really organized for ecotage, and they will be, because they'll be bright guys. It's only the really bright guys that, that see where this is going, the kind of Uncle Ted types. And those guys are smart enough to not just take out, uh, you know, one single point of failure in the system. They can take out the backup to that thing. So, for example, take, for example, glass. Well, if, if, if you take out the natural gas system somehow you could do it just with stuxnet or you know kind of logic bomb if if you just take the, the gas facilities with um cyber warfare and then at the same time you go one step more and take out the ceramic industry the ceramic so basically i'll tell you a secret the the glass industry is entirely reliant on ceramics high temperature ceramics the very few com uh, companies like a handful, like I mean one or two, literally, that can actually make the ceramics for these things. Because it's a very, very niche world. They basically have molybdenum and a few of these. So it's it's very uh, artisanal, it's all secret knowledge, and it's done in one or two factories. So if you took out the, the ceramics thing, th that would be the end of it. It would take five years to get, maybe 10 years to rebuild those factories. So if you took out glass, and then ceramics, you, you took out the glass, they wouldn't be able to rebuild the glass factories. That, well, they'd have to rebuild the factories and the furnaces. Well, if you took out the ceramics, that would be it. So they, they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to rebuild them in 10 years. The world without glass in 10 years, just imagine you wouldn't build another aircraft in 10 years. You wouldn't build another mm. tank, a submarine, a ship, nothing. A car. Mm. They would all, all be gone. You, you wouldn't build an, another test tube. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do another vaccination. They're all based on glass. And so, well, so this is, any, this is anybody great. can find that out. It'd be great for the local anybody glass. Anybody can find that out. And it's, 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 like, it's one person, an individual, a lone wolf could do. Even down to the... Uh, oh, there's, go on, loads, there's loads of little 
still tiny in lots of little countries in the world of people who are still making artisanal glass and would be totally delighted to hear a thing like this. <laughs> to make the world's glass, yeah. No, but, but they would say, fast, they say oh, we don't care. We continue to make our glass to drink our wine. <laughs> Yeah, um, that, oh, was an, yeah, yeah, that was no, an interesting glasses, point about the glasses. The, glasses is a real skill. It's a real. It's oh art, yeah, but there's, there's still some skill, artisans. Yeah. Artisans are even here in the south well, of Ireland. Yeah, no, yeah. Tiny little factories, yeah, little up, 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 family run. You know. Mm. Uh, so, so up in the northwest, in in Seattle, the you know Chihuly and all of that is the the artisanal glass movement is huge. The, up in the northwest, people would be still making artisanal beer and whiskey and putting in an artisanal glass because they're doing it right now. It's the tanks and Boeing that would, <laughs> would be in real trouble. <laughs> that was yeah. an interesting point it's in that little, uh, that little report on the rubber industry was that it, it wasn't in the hands of large holders. It was, it was all... Yeah, most of the suppliers coming from very small plantation holders, just a couple of acres, um, which I thought that was surprising that it hadn't been sort of corporatized and amalgamated. Um, but the other thing that was very interesting from the point of view of, of sort of buggering stuff up is uh, where they said that most of the plants, are, a bit like the banana plants, they're all clones. And so they're, they're uh, uh, very susceptible to disease and and uh, you know oh, so you could have yeah. some yeah. some somebody with a little little glass well can't be glass anymore <laughs> a little tiny uh, container of something which will infect rubber trees and that's that's it you know um, yeah I mean it's it's just a bioweapons target but it, I mean mm. uh, same with pestilence right you it, you see what's this this civilization doesn't stand a chance because if you think of like climate change and deforestation, what's one of the things that happens is you get pest infestations and insect infestations. And the chances of a monocrop like that coming, you know, a pest comes out and it's happening with everything from frogs to rust on all these wheat and stuff. And so it's, you know, all of these things are vulnerable from, you know, glyphosate resistant weeds and stuff. They're all resistant because they're all monocultured. They're all resistant to single points of failure. And somebody will introduce them. As soon as enough people realize that, you know, become accelerationists, that's it. The, the yeah, system the, the is going to come down tree, like the house. Of the rubber tree that's in Thailand um, in, the, in the report uh, are being cloned and they are, they are monoculture. But the origin, um, the original rubber trees were in the Amazon, and they were scattered. They were not, you know, they, used to, they had to go deep and take the sap, and you know, sometimes it was. And there's still some in French Guiana and different places, and they're scattered all around. So, yeah, you've got you've got this this little niche in Thailand that's going to probably be wiped out uh, due to climate change, and uh, but. Um, the other, the other, it will take. It would take years and years again for them to clone and and replant uh, trees from the originals in the Amazon. So that is a that is another bottleneck. Because it was couldn't... very similar to uh, that. You'd have the kind of time delay Hugh was just talking about yeah. with the glass. You know, they were saying seven or eight years to get a tree. You know, before you could use it uh, for the rubber. Uh, well, well, they can uh, make synthetic that... rubber, right? They, mm -hmm. they can make synthetic rubber, but nothing works. You can only go so far, right? They're like gaskets and things for pipes and engines and stuff like that. They, mm -hmm. um, there's so many rubber components that um, can't all be synthetic. And then if if there was a big failure in, say, a year's crop or so, well, no, I guess it's not seasonal there. But if there was a big failure in the crops there, they couldn't bring on all the the factories online to make synthetic rubber, and then it would alter the you know the logistics of the oil market and stuff like that. So, mm. it, yeah, this it's it is a house of cards. It's very Byzantine. It's very brittle. It's just in time. It's uh, it's fragile as anything. And uh, if climate change doesn't do it, ecoterrorism is going to do it. But the thing is that they know they know all this. And they're not telling anybody. 
so the governments are all preparing for this. They all know what's coming. It's all a matter of time. But when once you see the evergreen, um, oh, the evergreen, what's her name? You know, stuck in the Suez Canal from possibly a cyber attack. You, you can see, <laughs> you know, you do that, and you do the say, you know, the the Panama Canal at the same time. And it's like, well, that's it. That's the end of the global economy right there. Yeah, it would be really it's, ironic. It's inconceivable. It, it would be really ironic because I heard somebody make a joke about the evergreen getting stuck in the canal. It's like, yeah, a, a lot of the stuff with like, you know, the capitalist system sells causes lots of people to die of heart disease. He was talking about how it'd be funny if like the capitalist system itself died of a giant cardiac arrest. <laughs> it'd be ironic. It's, if something. Yeah, it's very well, um, uh, analogous, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, um, see, one of the things is is that that makes the system vulnerable is nobody understands it. So so it's it's made by a kind of Smith's invisible hand. So it, in other words, it's I can't remember who pointed it out, but it said there's nobody actually knows how to make a pencil because there's no one person that knows how to do the graphite and get the rubber and the, so so there's nobody you know it's a collaboration there's like your computer nobody knows how to make a computer there are thousands and thousands of people that know how to put bits together and then they they modular and stuff but even, you know even the guys that designed it don't know how to mine the you know tritium or stuff like that and so what it means is that they could get a cascading failure and not understand what's happening. So in other words, the evergreen could be a kind of butterfly. And then they've got, they had like millions of, you know, two billion, I think, in value in containers. And so, so you could have a vital shipment in those containers that nobody knew about that is a sensitive um, point of failure for a vital system and it could cascade. It could be like a butterfly that just cascades through the system and no one would understand it. Nobody would understand the system well enough to know, oh, you know what? It was from this little widget that was on the evergreen. <laughs> Basically, it got rotten or something. So if all you know, there was a, you know, a container full of bananas that went rotten because it was stuck in the canal. And you didn't know that bananas were vital <laughs> to making, you know, all the strategic military components. I don't. I think there are a lot of people who know about about those things, and I think there's a lot of people who we don't hear from, who are probably studying all these bottlenecks. And I, I'm sure I'm not, not sure they're listening, but. <laughs> be nice. Well, well, the fantastic thing is the fantastic thing is. That a lot of them are state actors. So, so the the most amount of study being done for this kind of thing is in the military, but they don't study their own. No, well, they do kind of, but they do kind of assessments. So risk assessments. Well, you know, like if there was a high altitude EMP in the states, how much damage would it cause? And it's always the same thing: huge amount of damage. Please give us more money for defense. And so, but. They, when they, they, they really go into deep analysis when they're looking at enemy systems. So then they do a proper analysis of how to basically take them out, and particularly countries like Israel does, you know, has all these guys like Talpiot and Unit 8200, all these, these, these psychopaths in there since the thinking every day is how do we bring down the enemy and stuff and looking at their systems in detail is basically it's operational research. And, but the, so, so the guys that are very likely to do this are, are, you know, basically the elephants could take each other down. It's basically the, the states could fuck each other over in this way. So, so we, it's, it's, it's not necessarily anarchists or, you know, no, liberation or anything like that. that it can be state actors. They could take each other down. The, those psychopaths, they... They published them. I mean, you posted on on Reddit a long time ago a total list of from the American military about all the dangerous spots and all the points of of, the, of weaknesses in the system and everything. They have it all listed and it's online, so anybody can access that. Yeah, this uh, free information. It's like all the data facilities and stuff. 
uh, for Amazon. Most of the computing now in the commercial realm and government realm, it's it's all on on Amazon distributed um, in Amazon Web Services all around the world. But all those facilities, they listed. You don't have to do. <laughs> you don't have to go very far down the dark web to see every one of those things. And they they all you know kind of low profile, bomb proof, flood proof kind of things. They then they're not manned the dark sites um but you know they all have inputs and outputs they all they all have a have to be powered <laughs> they don't have a bit of you know emergency ge power generation and they have a bit of halogen for a fire and they might be hardened to take a missile or something but like you know damn well there's some guy that comes in to feed the cat <laughs> that that's, uh, knows there's some vital thing that they need yeah. Hugh, can I just go back to the sort of globalist transhuman class swab agenda thing, um, which is, you know, just personally, when I look at that, I think their enterprise is doomed because circumstances are just going to completely overtake them before they get very much further. I mean, maybe that's hopeful thinking. I don't know. But surely they're aware that they're trying to Surely they must be aware that they're trying to introduce something um, in, into a situation that's collapsing more or less before their very eyes, and yet they're persisting as though as though this can just be rolled out regardless. And um, I was just integrating that a bit with that uh, Irish guy, um, uh, Malcolm. So it was Kevin Malcolm, was it? The, the 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 preacher, the Christian guy. He did his little video, you know, oh, and he was going through that. Him. Yeah, yeah, where where he was saying the biblical thing about the world being divided into ten kingdoms or something like that. And uh, I was kind of wondering, is that likely to be a way that uh, that they will go? Was it okay? You the world will be divided up into zones. And it might only be three of them are privileged and get this whole trans transhuman digital miracle there, and the rest of them will just be uh, left, you know, as, as a place of exploitation. And then it will just shrink back until there's only one zone, two zones, and then one, and then you know, it will just be a little enclave and then fizzle out. But uh, I, I still find it remarkable that they're persisting in the face of this. Like, are they that? Are they that completely divided that they must know what's going on, and yet they're still marching down the road anyway? Yeah. Well, so I didn't give a lot of credence to that ten zones thing. I mean, there might be some kind of economic zones like. Oh, ASEAN I'm just using that as a, as a. As a yeah, but I was just just sort of using that as. That's a, not how they think. Mm. Well, but that's not how those guys think. They don't think in terms of landmass. That's kind of. What they're trying to get away from is national boundaries and stuff. So they they think they almost like anarchists. They think in terms of a borderless world and freedom of movement. But the the ten controlling in uh, interests is basically it's all controlled by the banks and the financial system. And the the ten controlling in interests are big corporations. So it's multinational corporations. So when when they keep on going on about public private cooperation, what they're hinting at is fascism. So it's, it's basically they're thinking in terms of a benevolent fascism. So you have, you know, one world government, which was kind of like the United Nations and stuff. But it's, it's you see, all these guys, they don't need a governor, right? They, they all think the same way. They all suck each other's dicks. They just, they, they're almost clones of each other. So they, they don't need a big parliament or anything. They, they, they know instinctively you know how to behave so it's it's basically you you don't need space governance or anything like that because jeff bezos um elon musk and uh richard branson they all like pals they all understand each other they all know we all little boys having a race into space and you know it's all jolly fun and and they all know to if there was a threat from any any side they 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 wouldn't even have to phone each other up to to deal with it. So it's, so, it's kind of so like the Hydra, the, where if you cut off one, 
you, you cut off one head and it just grows another one kind of thing where it's got plenty well, of well, heads Well, it's, it's a class. So, so it's, it's, it's ruled by the class. They, they, they would just, you know, decide things long range in these meetings like the BIS and uh, Davos and stuff. It's just, they're largely just formalizing what they do at the golf course and in these clubs and on these yachts and in these planes. And they, so they, they just, you know, there's a lot of this buzzy bee stuff going on in the background. And then it just gets sort of formalized and sanctified in Davos. It's kind of like a big rah, rah, um, a meeting of the cult It's basically a big uh, motivational session for the cult. But, uh, but so, so in terms of a one world, government it's not going to be like star wars or something where they have everybody sitting you know in the stadium and then you take the podium and argue for this these guys don't argue right they they the most thing they'd argue is like who got the youngest girl from epstein you know me or you it's like ha ha jab jab you know it's basically they don't argue they all work together right they have no major disagreements there's nothing to resolve they all think the same way so they compete in the same way as everybody at the golf course competes, but like they, they they drink in the same clubhouse and think exactly the same way, so they're not really competing in any meaningful way. And so 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 you you're not going to get a big parliament or something in the United Nations that then rules the world. We're already, in fact, there. We're already in the one world order because all those guys are already pulling all the strings, all behind the scenes, and all the governments are just you know regional puppets for them so so there's there's not a you know when so so all they want to see is these broad alliances no no boundaries kind of like you know the european union and then it's they they trade barriers that they want to break down <clears throat> and then one day when they've got everybody by the you know the ring in their nose then they can do freedom of movement but it, it's it's almost exactly what anarchists want, except for some key differences. And one of them is that they're eugenicists. And they they are the they they really neoplatonists. If you go, if you want to see the genesis of all of this, it's Plato's Republic. And Plato says that the men of gold and men of silver and men of copper and things like that. And he's saying that these are the men of gold. They think they're the men of gold. They're the superior ones. And then they think we're too stupid to run ourselves. They don't. None of them are Democrats because they think the population is too too dumb. And we prove it to them every fucking day. Every fucking day you go out and buy an Apple product or something, you're proving to Steve Jobs just how fucking stupid you are. So we so we we deserve these guys. But what they've told themselves is <coughs> is Plato said you do the noble lie, and the noble lie is. You make the people think they're in charge. And so this, this was worked out by, you know, in Plato's Republic. You go back to there, you can see Charles Schwab's agenda. And they, they, will, they will manage everybody. That they'll manage them from a health point of view. All the stuff that Allenson says, it'll be a eugenics program where they'll manage you financially, bodily, socially, and economically. So every part of your life, will, you'll be managed like a little toddler. And then... The, but it, and then they are the ones that will be free of it. So, so in other words, while you need a COVID passport, Bill Gates doesn't need one. If Bill, if if Bill Gates was ever stopped at an airport or something, and some some clueless customs officer said, "Excuse me, sir, uh, can I see your post, you know COVID passport?" Ten guys would jump on him and say, "Do you know who the fuck this is? It's Bill Gates. You fucking idiot. Fuck off." Bill Gates doesn't need, or he's they're essentially above the law, but they will impose all this on us. You know, basically, they will say that you have to have a, a cell phone and eventually they'll have to have an implant. But Bill Gates and Charles Schwab and stuff are, are immune to that kind of pettiness. So, so they will rule as absolutes and in the shadows. And because of the noble lie, everybody else will think they're in charge. So, so it's kind of like democracy today. They've got this big show going on where everybody thinks they're actually voting, but the, the voting, the levers behind the voting things are completely broken. So where where they fucking up, and why the anarchist vision is different is the anarchists have a positive view of humanity. They and 
And anarchists don't think that people are dumb as shit. The system is dumb as shit, and it makes people dumb as shit. And the system doesn't fit with humanity. But with these transhumanists, they put transhumanism, order, and the system above humanity. They think that humans must fit in with the system. Anarchists think that the system must fit in with humans, and it does. Remarkably, if you just leave everything alone, it fits in with humans. So, so the anarchist thing is, is very similar, but completely different at the, at the same time. It's kind of what I was saying to Kevin, was I was saying to Kevin about, you know, like, well, what's wrong with this one world order? Because as an anarchist, we're just trying to get rid of states. So if there's this one super state that dominates the whole world, our job just got easier by 152 other countries. So, so we could wait until we get to the point where they, you know, set up this one super system and then we game jack it. The, the problem why that doesn't really work is because uh, the, um, there's not going to be anything left of the environment. And when, when they get control of us, there's not going to be, it's going to be completely 1984, Brave New World. There's not going to be any opportunity for rebellion. Because there's a lot to that, you know, you will own nothing and you will be happy. It's, it's people, people will be unhappy, but they won't be able to define why they're unhappy. And that, so, so the, there'll be, you know, even things like suicide uh, will become apologized yeah. and you, you will get brain stimulus and you'll get, get yeah. drugs for, so you, you have this bland ennui that goes of, back of to just that. existing in this horrible existence and you don't know why. And then if you, if you ever complain or anything, they would treat it as, as your pathology and it wouldn't make you better. It would make you get over suicide and you'd have this hollow soullessness in you. You wouldn't yeah, feel that's, like that's... a human being, but you wouldn't even have the language to describe it. And that's that's where we're headed. That, that's that story that um, uh, Harlan Ellison story somebody put up, um, uh, you know, at the end where the machine had reduced, the, you know, I, have a, uh, I, I don't have a mouth and I have to scream or something, you know, it was, was where yeah. it ended up yeah. kind of thing. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, go back uh, um, uh, in that uh, article that was in the Unlimited Hangout about DARPA and all the rest of it. And you, you said there something a minute ago about uh, the anarchists doing it the other way around the, the, the system is to match the humans not the humans to the system and uh one of the comments made there was by um it was that woman uh who i think was uh in charge of the wellness wellness something or other what was the name of that and she said uh, that they wanted the well, to overcome the, well, the welcome wellness leap. the welcome leap. yeah welcome le yeah yeah and she, she said that they wanted to overcome the mechanical mismatch between humans and electronics. And you could see in that statement, you know, uh, the, the, the two things that you were just talking about, which was the, the globalist uh, and the anarchist, <clears throat> they're looking at the system and the humans, and one of them wants to match the humans up, and the other one wants to match the, 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 you know, the system up. It's the other way around. Um, you know, so you've got, now got to alter the... Uh, yes, yeah, so, so this, wait, can I interrupt here? Because this is damn yeah. important. So, so this is ex exactly the thing uh, that I was talking to Lionel Snell about. The, so, how it happens is they start off with, say, Babbage uh, doing, you know, Babbage calculator. And they're thinking, we'll, we'll put this machine in service of man. The problem is that the machines are really, they have a problem of, of measurement and the problem of, basically it's, it's the, the framing uh, is, ma makes them not really viable in fact, but it makes them logical and makes them predictable. So, but what happens is they put the machine, they propose this as putting the machine in service of humans. When the machine reveals its inadequacies, then they start reforming the humans to fit with the machine. So what you if the Hilbert program got far, and this is what the fourth industrial revolution is, is the Hilbert program, is, is 
they will start off saying that, well, this is for, makes life better. You know, in the Chinese, the social credit score, they like it because they say, well, everybody is untrustworthy. You know, humans bad. And so people in China like it because they say, well, we just have to look at your credit score. And now we know who can do business with, who we can safely do business with. So it increases trust. And then so it's good. And so, you know, but as the, the thing becomes more and more of a catch-22 and more and more uh, kind of um, Kafkaesque and Byzantine, then, they, then there'll be more and more emphasis on making the human fit with this machine because it's, it's, it's easier yeah. to make, the, it's more cost-effective to make the human fit this machine once you've made a, a completely digitized and <coughs> systematized world. So, so it, that that machine's limitations, you will be forced to compensate for the machine's limitations very soon after they put the system in, and that's where the hell starts for us. But the hell that you talk about, Gary was referring to um, <coughs> the transhumanist, the the, the fourth industrial uh, revolution, and its uh, its timing uh, with collapse because. Uh, we're in a short, we're in, we have a short window there. We know it all like, I mean, so I, I look at those nanotechnicians and not those, those, they're, they're okay. They're, they've advanced a lot, but they're far away from being able to implement that in terms of, uh, and I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, we don't know, but it, it can go fast. I'm not a specialist in that. Not, not, not forever. It's fiction. No, no, no for, forever. It's, it's fiction. Yeah, no, I no, think all so. of this stuff is, 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 is it's 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 magic. It, it's it's actually worse than the, the worst nonsense magic that you've ever seen. The stuff that Neuralink and all these promises that what the brain's going to do, it's lies. It's horseshit. I'll tell you the automation. AI is a myth. There's no machine intelligence. You might as well get a wind up toy. But nobody none of these guys don't know. These guys don't know this. You see, all the enthusiasts, the guys like Elon Musk, all these guys that are making these predictions, you know they know fuck all about it. You know that he's never programmed a computer or done any AI because he talks about it in this way. Anybody that tells you, anybody that's really done any recommendation engine, any one of these systems, uh, automation systems, any kind of this uh, tooling or, or automated manufacturer, they'll tell you that these machines don't work without humans. They're just, they're just extensions of humans. And these guys don't get it. They, they're retards, in fact. They, 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 are, they are basically Asperger's. Um, they're 12-year-olds. And so, so basically, they, Charles Schwab and that doesn't understand technology. Bill Gates doesn't understand technology. Bill Gates wrote a few programs. Hugh, you know, can I jump in? Devon, so I was I'm fine with this. And it was it was pathetic. Bill Gates barely knows how to program, but he's he's one of the greats of you know he's the Yoda of technology. These guys are cretins. They don't understand this technology, so it's all fake. But anyway, you can't yeah. say that because everybody says, "Oh no, no, surely the BBC can't be wrong." Yes, quantum computing, Here. all the stuff is is it's 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 not ten years away. It's never it's never going to happen. You, I think this goes back to something. It connects back to something uh, you brought up a few a little while ago. I think it was with the the uh, when we were, you were talking about the glass industry and the ceramics and all the rest of it. <clears throat> uh, and the the point I wanted to make there was, uh, uh, oh yes, I think you said something about um, how nobody knows how to make like a complete machine you know because i mean it's it's so it's, it's just a divided up process and all the rest of it but i think what we got in the world at the moment because of uh, increasing specialization i guess and disconnection from people doing things for themselves making things or or learning how to be be handy with with, with uh, various skills is that um there's there is there isn't a kind of intuitive grasping people of how things are made and how things are done and so they're very easily led astray by this kind of magical thinking because you can sell it to them because they don't get it that that it's it can't be done that way you know like in terms of what for instance just now when you're talking about uh elon musk and all the rest of them and your understanding of the kind of digital computer whole whole thing like that you can see that he doesn't grasp 
you've got you've got you've got a you've got a real feeling for it, and and you can tell that it's bullshit. Whereas he doesn't. He's just looking at it from the outside, much as like, you know, the person who who's got a car, um, and it needs repair, and and the mechanic says it needs this and this, and they're completely clueless. The mechanic could could say anything he liked, and the person will has no appreciation whatsoever of how yeah. the machine works, well, what's involved with its operation. And so well, you can sell them anything. Um, and the other side of it is, of course... Well, but you see, they're enthusiasts, up. right? They're not engineers. They're, they're enthusiasts. Yeah, so yeah. They're, they're technology I, I enthusiasts, but they're not engineers. They don't yeah. even understand the first no, thing about engineering. And, and, I mean, as, and if they as did, they wouldn't be enthusiasts. Well, yeah, no well, one that really yeah. understands technology well as a technology enthusiast. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, that sums it up, I guess. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I'm trying to say. But you know, I, I mean, much as there's problems with, with engineers, uh, that they at least get how things are done, you know. And if there's if there's something missing from that that cycle, they're not going to be deluded that it can still be done. They're just going to say, no, you can no longer do that. Yeah, can I? Can and I add comes, when you finish? Yeah, go on. You know, I, I'm just going to add one small thing, yeah, yeah. which was I think this also applies to the whole. Uh, appreciation of the seriousness of the the ecological and climatic situation mm. is that the people just don't get um, it, it's an abstraction for them and they sort of only seeing it from the outside they, they don't get a feeling for it like if you if you even know a little bit about engineering and look at the the, the kind of thermal inertia in, in a place like the Arctic, and and just just you don't even have to do a calculation. Just your sense of of it will tell you that by the time it's starting to melt at the rate it's melting now, you've missed the boat by decades and decades. But but most people don't have that kind of they don't have a feeling for that. They don't get that part of it, and so then they can just run off and be in delusion about it because they don't have some other part of them telling them that this is just absolutely huge. You know. Well, that's exactly. Anyway, so if you, I was going to I was going to add. Because the likes of that Scottish, Irish uh, preacher, the likes of Alison, the likes of a lot of ranters against the fourth industrial revolution and, and transhumanism are completely clueless, it seems to me, about the imminent climate collapse that's coming. And, the, and the, uh, even Alison, I don't think she, she grasps um, that it's like, okay, the environment, the flowers, uh, protect let's be green she's probably vegan i don't know but they, they don't they don't go there so they they can go very deep into understanding and dissecting the dangers of transhumanism and ai and all this thing and digitalization digitalization oh jeez i can't say it children and everything but they there's not a, there's no clue about this no no reference to actually the oh, imminent boy. yeah very, very few people have the complete picture. That's why I was very, I was very, I, I mean, I get despondent about these people like Dimitri because I had high hopes for him having a complete view and suddenly he just went completely Russian nationalist and now everything is just interpreted in, well, Russia's fantastic. So you can't talk beyond, you know, climate change. Well, Russia will survive. <laughs> it's like, okay, can just fucking forget about Russia now and just talk about collapse. No, but it's the and core so of the earth. Everybody the has their, their partial, right? They have their, their hole in the thing. Yeah. But can I so, make can I make two yeah, points there? Do you uh, mind? I'd like to make yeah, two yeah. points. One is uh, just thinking about that. That, like you know, if you go back uh, a, a few centuries. You didn't have that. You have a lot of uh, educated people were polymaths. You know, they 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 had a, 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 a you know each finger of their hand was in a different discipline, so to speak. It wasn't called that then. And also, like with the alchemists, they 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 were, uh, you know, they 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 were they were looking at the whole like everything from the rock to the to the to the to the uh, most ethereal immaterial. S sort of spirit, so to speak, um, uh, and you know that that's a major thing that's been lost because there aren't people like that now. Then you know, there's a very small number of people have got um, got their knowledge spread. I suppose it's impossible now with with the expansion of, of detailed knowledge. Um, but the other point was, uh, I think, just 
going back to what Sophie was just saying about uh, the Irish preacher and um, and uh, uh, Alison, uh, but that's also true. I think a characteristic of people on the right is that they they maintain a very precise uh, understanding, but it's quite narrow. Um, uh, and um, so in a way, they're very effective, <clears throat> um, but their promises is the, the promise that they have, you know, the, the, um, uh, the possibility of what they could do, like with Alison, is completely wasted because she's, she's, she's got herself into her, her little view and she, she won't broaden it. Uh, and so it can, can sort of completely annuls her, her, um, her effectiveness. So same with that preacher guy, actually. He, you know, as, as Sophie said underneath that, he made some really good points. And then he just blew it all at the end with his bloody Bible, you know. Uh, and uh, and it's it's it even he didn't even see the contradiction in his own logic that if he was going to pray this away, then it would also pray away the biblical prediction that he was leaning on. And, and so, did he actually believe in this Bible or, or not? Like he he was actually digging out the ground from under his own feet, even right at the end. Uh, but yeah. they don't. So, he wasn't aware of it, you know. Yeah, it's the so, problem so of self-reference. Cults. Yeah, so they're all self-referential cults, and the Christian cults, they can because they're leaning on St. Paul's cult. They are kind of outside the mainstream cult, so they can see it for what it is but then they're still bound by their own cult and so they're still bound by the bible bashing so so it's like allison uh they can see it all but then it all lands in therefore the bible <laughs> and so therefore our cult so they know better off they're going to go down with the the standard cult. but that you see nobody wants to admit to doomerism because really there are too many, it's too multifaceted. You, it's not a question of knowing lots of facts. It's a question of getting some street smarts. So when you get a bit of experience of the world and a bit of experience of how machines work and how politics works and how finance works, then you go like, okay, I've pretty got the, well, got the lay of the land. You don't have to know every, every fact uh, you know, on Wikipedia. In fact, it's a detriment to know all of that. But you, you can get to know exactly how this works, and, and it, it, then you look very cynical. So nobody listens to you after that because you look like a cynical Cassandra. But you see, wh whether we're heading for uh, collapse or not depends entirely on whether what you feel like uh, in yourself. So if, if you just got a new job and you really wanted the job and now you feel great because you've got your you know your dream job and stuff like that then there's then doom will be after 2100 if ever if you've just been fired from your you know a job that you hate well then doom's in 2026 <laughs> so it's it's got far more to do with the, your your own how positive you are and how optimistic you are Oh, what it can means I... is that, that we all know that, that the, the systems we all know that the system's going to collapse. It can't. I mean, it cannot you know, go. I mean, yeah, you've got to be a nut like Steven Pinker or something to just extrapolate the graph. A, a cursory analysis will show you that there's so many problems from demographics, from climatology, from resource use. We're just just fucking running out of water, and um, and, and just the ecology going. You can see that. You know, this is this house of cards cannot hold. So what it means is that as we go, more and more people will get depressed, and when they get depressed, then they'll see the situation for what it is. So you know, um, the range so, of of the doomers are just going to grow and grow and grow, and and yeah, it's, it, it'll just... be harder and harder for people to be optimistic. But they get their optimism yeah. for something like the Bible. So that, so that the number of people that will go for flat earth kind of solutions or Bible solutions or the aliens come and save us or technology, it actually get the problem gets worse as people actually come out of their collapse denial. 
Crisis cults, um, right? Yeah, I wanted to bring up, uh, I don't know if it's relevant, <clears throat> but for some reason or another, I was thinking about Guy McPherson while he was saying that. And I thought, well, what's happened there? He's shut down and closed up shop. Um, is there anything behind that, in your opinion? Some kind of realisation, perhaps? Or, or he's just being Guy McPherson? No, he got, I think the way I read it is he got ego fatigue. He was, he was just doing narcissism. And he just ran out of narcissistic reflection. He, he there's something you, you're talking about, McPherson, right? Yeah, McPherson. Yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah, McPherson so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, he, yeah. My interpretation was he was working entirely from ego, and he was mm. on this kind of revenge trip. He, he kind of saw the writing on the wall as an ecologist, and said, you know, well, we must all go homesteading. And do this parallel polis, and and so you know he he went off and was amazed, but nobody followed him, and so he he came back to civilization like a Jeremiah saying like woe to you 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 know it's like a vengeful prophet saying like you know you're all going to be you know roast in hell and you deserve it, and so he got a few. He got a bit of narcissistic reflection from all these doomers that said, yes, yes, I cut my balls off so that I wouldn't have any kids. And all these breeders, yeah, they're going to die in hell and fire. And, <laughs> and they're basically, and Sam Mitchell also has that crowd. They, and, yeah, and they, Sam's they, very good at that. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, and so it's, it's, it's all this gloating sour grape stuff. And you can only, you know, he lost his audience because he, he, he was so difficult to interview, put so many restrictions on. And, um, you know, it, 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 the narcissism, just no one would go there. Again, it was almost the same thing as where he went off grid. Was he, he in the in social media and YouTube, his viewers, viewership just fell and fell and fell because, because well, it was the same, was very, the uh, same demand for it's all about him and collapses. Well, I, I think and that's one of the main reasons why it's gone. Some paradox. Yeah. I think nobody yeah, can uh, talk to him anymore. I mean, uh, if you look at right. him, it, it went down <laughs> and down. he stopped his nature bats last and everything because nobody was listening to it anymore. It was just gone. Like I think yeah, he, he wasn't getting narcissistic supply. He wasn't getting his his uh, his, his Yeah, I was amazed during that uh, that uh, recording of the last Nature Bats last thing. It was it all started off very nice until sometime into the thing, a difficult person rang up, <laughs> and it just turned nasty straight away. He he just shut the guy down and got and, and Pauline came on. If you know, you've got to understand. If you don't really like what you're hearing here, you don't have to listen. You know. And I thought, oh, the pair of them were just so absolutely creepy at that point that that, that you know it was just like a, we we will not entertain a different point of view. We won't give you five seconds to to. To, to bring up a legitimate challenge or anything like that. They, they were just running off into their own little thing. Uh, you know, and, I mean, was, I stopped listening to it at that point because you could see that the whole thing was just a no, but that, joke that, anyway. That running yeah. off into their own little thing, I take very badly. I, th I mean, mm. I, I got a terrible, terrible vibe from that. I, I thought... You know, if in the next week we find out they all just had a little party and took the phenobarbital and stuff with the Kool-Aid around the fire or something, it's like I wouldn't be surprised because it, it was written all over that thing. You could just – the dynamic that they were expressing there is like, oh, my God, this is Heaven's Gate. Uh, and so yeah, yeah. I, it did have that. I, I, keep on warning people about it. I couldn't go further than 10 but minutes. I, I keep on warning Lucky people the... is this hmm. – Same that? here. I, 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 same as Sophie, I only got to that point where there was this little difficult section where somebody rang up and they were being difficult. And, uh, and uh, I, I couldn't, I thought there's well, no well, point in listening to it anymore. You know, <laughs> that, that was enough. But that's a good point what you're making about the kind of Kool Aid crisis that he well, could be. Well, but here's um, the thing this, this is very important. This is very, very important because the whole McPherson saga is the alien cortex, right? It's the alien cortex. You can see the alien cortex self-loathing and the whole thing, this, zen, you know, yen for immortality is going off grid to save us, <coughs> all the cultish thing, everything 
I've been trying to tell people is all kind of embodied in it. Now, mm -hmm. when when you see that Kool-Aid moment, you see them going off on their little thing and they're saying like, we going to do that on a global fucking scale. I'm trying yeah. to tell as many people that can hear is that it's, I, I say again and again, everything's a cult. Our mainstream culture is a cult. It's going to go to that same Kool-Aid moment. Think about it. Think where we're going to. We, we have all these positivists, these futurologists. They're going to do all this fantastic one health thing. And it's all this brave new world. It's not going to work. It's built on fantasy. It's going to be a long, slow slog with some bad news. They're going to double down. They're going to be doing geoengineering. And basically, it'll work in the short term. But it'll make things progressively worse in the long term. And it will really seal our fate. And so when things go badly with geoengineering, then imagine the Kool-Aid moment. Then imagine, you know, we're all McPhersons and we're all like, you know, this was never meant to be. Humans are not viable. You know, it's 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 better for what's left of the earth that we, we end the story. It's it, this is it's laced with the self-pity. And what they will do is they will try and take out as much as they can on the way out. So then it's saying like, you know what? Life was evil. It was life itself that shouldn't have been done. A pure world is a desert, not only without people, but without life. It was intelligence. It was, it was consciousness that was wrong. We must take it out. We must erase it. It's the void, a blank slate. That's the purity. And they will try and do it on a global scale. That's where we're headed. So you're seeing in microcosm where we're going in macrocosm. And it's like, it's the deepest question is, you know, what's the point of existence? And is it just to keep going? It's like, it's the theater. And we, we don't want to end our story. It, you're not human if you're not pro-life. And so if you, if you go down this path, you will get to death. These guys are... You know, talking about immortality, they're talking about, uh, they sound like they're talking about life. They say, life will get better. People's lives will get better. They'll be richer. They'll be enhanced. No, they won't. They'll be more dead. Basically, life is chaotic. The more ordered it gets, the more dead it gets. So these guys will be saying, now your life is better. Look, it's more ordered. No, I'm miserably unhappy. Nothing happens out of the ordinary. There are no surprises. It's basically, there's no chaos. It's predictable as anything. It's root canal therapy every single day. And so they're killing us, killing us while they're telling us that this is for your safety. This is for your longevity. This is for your life. But self-evidently, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And saying like, no, the thing that they taught you was wrong. Chaos, disorder, dysfunction. That's what life is. Life is messy. So, like, life is in the shit. <laughs> life grows out of manure. The essence of life is all the dirty, mucky, messy, chaotic shit. You have to learn to embrace that. But these guys are like, no, it's the clean, pure, predictable, precise. And they say, no, that's death. You see, you see black people in, in Africa know this. One of the reasons why white people hate black people in Africa is, is, is because the, they, if you ask a white person uh, what they don't like, I mean, what, ask a black person what, what they don't like about w white people, uh, they, they will say they remind them of death. And you say, like, like how? And they say, well, well, it's everything about, uh, about us. Because we, we smell, we don't, we don't like to smell earthy. We put perfume on. And a black person associates that with a corpse that's laid out and cleaned. That's, you know, you sterilize a corpse and put it in formaldehyde so that it's, it's ready to be buried. And so a black person would only get dressed up in white if it was a shroud. So the fact that, you know, you know, for a black person, bones are white. So white is the associate with death. Now, white people associate black people with death because it's disordered and it's carly and it's chaotic and it's dark and it's the heart of darkness in Africa. And, all, and you know, they, so, so white people come to Africa thinking this is chaos. 
This is, this is the forces of evil and this tide of shit, and we must fight to keep the candle burning in the darkness. But you see, black people think that's life. It's chaotic. It's it's living. It's it's being, <laughs> and that's why that's why we hate uh, black people. They they in you know, white people, the colon, uh, colonists that came, because they represented disorder, death, errors, Kali. Yeah, the Aryans, or universally, when they got to India, they also thought of Kali, who was considered life, because <laughs> she's black. Then they considered it death. You know. So anyway, I hope that paints a picture of how we've living in upside down world. May, Good place may to I, stop. <laughs> may, may I? May I? Just before we go, you said something that brought a question to my mind because it looks like you see that geoengineering is going to happen, um, and there's a lot of voices. Undoubtedly. I would, yeah, I hope not, but um, I wonder if we shouldn't slip that to faulty. Well, I don't know what's the position of, uh, you know, because that is the forefront of the of the big, big dangers we, we have to we have to face. And I would really like to know where he stands on that, because that's fundamental. That's good. I don't think he, he's even very aware of it, but but that's good. Good you brought that up because. I think that that is the biggest danger we face. Um, well, I think now we passed the tipping points. I think we basically passed. Uh, there's so many indications that we passed a serious climate tipping point or two. And so what that means is the most dangerous thing facing us now, in my view, is geoengineering. And it's coming. It's just in what forms it takes. But it, it'll take some innocuous forms for kind of land management and stuff. To some things which you really don't want to do, like sprinkle glass beads <laughs> on the Arctic ice, all the way to marine card brightening, which is like just vacuuming up marine life oh, and oh, spurting oh, it oh, in oh, the oh, air. And oh, then oh, uh, plankton story, like yeah, or water yeah you're basically just chewing up plankton. And and, and anyway, it, you know the vapor is uh, vapor is a greenhouse gas. Water vapor is a green, one of the most potent greenhouse gases. So. The, the chances that they get it right and they actually put it up correctly so that it actually cools instead of warms and stuff is, is it's not going to happen. And so they're going to fuck that up. But And then the worst of all is is SRM, solar radiation management, putting sulfates up in the water and just then just poisoning the seas, making the pH uh, so we, you know, so that marine life dies off and then we're in serious trouble. But so so it's a spectrum where David Keith is the psychopath that please somebody just shoot the fuck just just shoot him man just uh, and then all the way to kind of you know like Pleistocene Park and this kind of um, uh, you know all the all these kind of uh, in in the in Canada and stuff they're doing Arctic reclamation and stuff and all of that it's not, it's not so bad it's reforestation um, Bex and stuff is doesn't work. Um, uh, direct carbon capture, it's like, that's nah, anti-science. It's, <laughs> it, it's a violation of basic physics. So none of it really works, but they're going to be doing it. Um, so it's, it's just insanity on the Titanic. But it's the yeah, kind think, of insanity um, that we can't come back to. Yeah, it's it, a you know, it kind of reminds me too. I think it was, I can't remember if it was the Mayan or Aztec civilization, but when their society started collapsing from the crop failures, they started sacrificing more and more and more. And I think that's what's, what this tech civilization is going to do is, it, is it's going to sacrifice more and more of the earth for more and more machines. And it's just going to keep going until we're all dead unless yeah, we stop it. Yeah, uh, basically, geoengineering is is a form of um, of avoidance behavior. But it'll it'll eventually get down to you know rip another heart out of a baby is um, you know and sacrifice it to climate change. It's pretty much what geoengineering ends up. <laughs> Hand me another baby. We'll sacrifice it on the altar and see if that brings down the CO two. You have to feed Malik, and maybe he won't be hungry, but you know he's eternally hungry. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it, it's trying to make a token sacrifice instead of and avoiding the real sacrifice. The real sacrifice is stopping industrial activity. But that's too simple. <laughs> we have yeah, to you, like, you, do you the alcoholic bargaining. Try say, 
Yeah, I, I'm not going to stop drinking, but if if I start jogging, is that okay? What about if I if I eat more healthy, then I can keep on having like a <laughs> bottle of whiskey a, a night, you know? It's like fucking hell, dudes. <laughs> it's like yeah. you need to stop drinking. Industrial civilization is poisoning us. Yeah, I need to get the the luddites. Well, on that to... note, I gotta get the Luddites together with the hammer to smash that crucible and save some babies. <laughs> yeah, but it's such an easy narrative, and this is what we must convince Faulty of. It's like it's this narrative is is the winning narrative. Save oh, the you know, babies from the machine. Get maybe, the babies out of Moloch more. That's such an easy win. Silver maybe you narrative. should talk to Faulty about, you know that talk you did with, um, God, what's his name? Was it, um, I can't remember his name, but you talked to him about that Metropolis movie and Greta and stuff. Those were really good conversations. Maybe yeah, Faulty Hank. interviewed them. Yeah, Hank, yeah. Hank, Hank, yes, those. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what we were talking about there is it. It's absolutely it. It's hard yes. for people to understand, I think, but it is the essence of it. You understand all of this, but I, I think it went over most people's heads. So, so if the bigger, the biggest challenge is the geoengineering, probably even more than the Great Reset, because the Great Reset seems to be um, founded on faulty ground and just hubris, but. Are they kind of related, the transhumanism and uh, geoengineering? Is it all deification of science or scientism? Because, um, I mean, how, yeah. how do we even resist the... I mean, resisting the Great Reset is probably moot because if it's bound to fail because it's just a grandiose idea. But the, the geoengineering... Um, oh, oh, it, 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 how, it'll, how do it'll have, it have to cause damage when it fails. Oh, oh no! It'll cause damage when it fails. But, but so the um, the res resistance to that is is easy because it's an overreach, and it really it's the point where this uh, future uh, utopianism falls down because the the average person does does not want to do geoengineering. So. You can really get a groundswell against geoengineering is bad enough that people will start throwing their bodies in front of these machines. Here, can or, I can I interrupt? But, can but, I, no, no, hang on a minute. But, but uh, so, okay. so 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 the the thing the thing is that um, yeah, so 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 the, the, it is a step too far. But if if people go against geoengineering and they cannot. They're not able to implement geoengineering pro pro uh, projects. If they stumble, if the people do prevail against them, it puts the whole eco uh, the whole uh, transhuman futurologist positivist uh, project in jeopardy. Because if you can't clean up the mess that you that you see, what they're doing with geoengineering is putting a bandaid on the problem. But if you don't allow them to put the Band-Aid on, they have to face the problem. So it works so well because geoengineering is beyond the pale. And if you, so we have a real possibility of getting a groundswell against that. If there is, it undermines their entire basis of their bigger project. And so, so that's why it works so well. Do you understand what I mean by that? Yeah. I think. Thanks. It's, it's kind of like a Here. chink in their armor. They have to do geoengineering to carry on their denial, and if they they can't, then it's a big flaw in their plan. Well, it's like the human doubt. The image of the, well, the image of the alcoholic. Like if if the wife keeps cleaning up after the the alcoholic, he'll never see the consequences of what he's doing. The day the family stops supporting the alcoholic, he he hits rock bottom. And he's faced with himself. It's the same image of addiction. If you, if you, uh, if you yeah, let exactly. It. If if you keep on wiping the, if you keep on wiping the alcoholic's ass, and you know when they go out disheveled with their, without their pants on in public, and you keep on, you know, basically putting their pants on for them to keep respectable. And where, the day you stop doing that and say, no, next time you go out in public drunk without trousers, we're not doing anything. <laughs> it's like. Oh, that's the end of that game.
<laughs> Hugh, I, I don't know if you made this point or, or somebody else did, uh, that, that I think there's a, 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 a little bit more to that story in that in, uh, for a little while, um, uh, that's, that this geoengineering could show a positive outcome. You know that 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 they'll play they'll play up the um, the success stories. Oh, you know, look, we're, we're suddenly getting rainfall in in you know in uh, drought stricken areas, and dams are filling up, and uh, there's been more Arctic ice forming this year than in the last ten years, and all the rest of it. And, and they they it's entirely possible that they might show a short term improvement in things. And obviously, they're going to lean on that very hard to push it, to market it, to to get people to accept it, and all the rest of it. Um, and I, I'm just thinking about that. I mean, that is a danger. That that that's something else that's thrown into the because it it, it could get a lot of people on side with it, get a lot of support for it, uh, and then when yeah. it reaches the point it's, where it's, where it is is not doing that, where it's becoming harmful. It, that'll then enable it to carry on, uh, you know, basically doing more damage because basically you can't get a result here that's positive unless you get a result over there that's negative, most likely, is the way it yeah. works, so, you know. So the, the, the reason why activists must work full ball against geoengineering is, is not because it won't work, it's because it will work. Uh, um, uh, they they will it will work if you put sulfates up in the atmosphere and stuff it'll work. I, in fact, marine cloud brightening and stuff would probably work too. But the, you see, the, the, that's the problem. It's exactly the same thing as like Lionel Snell was pointed out um, in, in that, that video. It's, it's like all of these things they work dramatically well to start off with, and the price comes later. So they're kind of like a deficit. It's kind of like deficit spending. And so what the reason why um, geoengineering is so dangerous is because it'll work, and then some William Nordhaus will get a Nobel Prize for saying, hey, guys, now we have control of the weather. You know, we don't have to worry about carbon targets anymore. We can go to 1,800 parts per million in CO2, and there's no fucking damage. We can just up the, you know, solar radiation management. And he'll saying, say, saying, well, if you, you know, here's the sweet spot. If you put up so much in sulfates, it'll cost two billion a year. And the, sure, the oceans will be acidic and too acidic for life. But who cares? Will you have fisheries ashore? And look at the model. It all works out. And so they say the sweet spot for the economy, for humans' benefit, and everything is. 1,800 parts per million. Burn the fossil fuels. To, you know, like, whoa, we can take out LNG to nothing. We can burn the last drop of oil. This is Christmas. And that's you know, what's so dangerous about it because they'll drop the ball and we'll be left with an 1,800 parts per million unlivable green hothouse earth. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be fucking Venus, basically. Yeah, that much carbon would probably turn this planet into Venus. Yeah, um, yeah. so that's, yeah, that's something we should... An all in bed. Yeah, what we should Geo do is press the... Geoengineering is an all-in bet on, on technology. Yeah, it's an all-in <laughs> bet on technology. It's absolutely 100% all-in. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things I think we should press is geoengineering. Like, the debt that will come will probably be turning this planet into fucking Venus, and so we got to stop that shit. <laughs> even, if we're, or even if our hand is dealt and we're, like, done as a species, we can't let, you know, the geoengineering kill everything else. Yeah. yeah. I am very concerned uh, about yeah, the I think I'm running a slogan. I'm very concerned about the position. I think our slogan should be like, stop it before it works. I, th I think our slogan should be, you must stop geoengineering before yeah. it works. But I would be very concerned about Faulty's position on geoengineering because I remember Jim Bendel um, in his first paper in, published in 2018. And, and at the end of it was saying, well, there will be techniques and I'm in favor of a few like uh, cloud brightening and to protect the Arctic and stuff like that. And so I know that there's a lot of people from his movement that are overlapping with Faulty's crowd in the UK. And I, I wonder really what is the undercurrent and the, posi and the position of, 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 uh, 
Faulty and his acolytes uh, for geoengineering, because I think, like you, that that's one of the biggest, biggest problem that we're going to face. Well, it's good you raised it because it's kind of make or break. If Faulty turns out to be a transhumanist, that's over. That's the end of the game right there. There's nowhere to go after that. If, if he's not on Team Human, I'm betting he is on Team Human, or if he. I, I'm betting that he doesn't really have the a clear picture of transhumanism and team human yet. But I'm predicting he will come down on team human because he's he's a humanist. He's I mean Gandhi Sat Satyagraha, he's an organic farmer. He he is fundamentally on team human. So it would just be a quirk in his brain if he thought like, well, geo geoengineering is good for team human. It would be easy to convince him that that isn't the case. But I believe he's fundamentally on team human. Um, oh, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. The, uh, I was just going to make the point that does Serpy want to talk? Do you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to say uh, but the, the, the success of geoengineering uh, is must be closely related to the success of the globalist the transhuman thing because it's where you know, they're establishing the new economy to fund it all. So, you know, you're really uh, you, you're going out against geoengineering. You're automatically dealing with the other aspect as well, I guess. Um, I was just saying that this is they, they're all about total control, and so that includes control of the biosphere, control of disease, control of the climate, control of resources, control of us. It's 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 total systems control, and it's it's an insane it's it's the insanest project that humans have ever come up with. But you see the reflection in the way the COVID crisis, which is a uh, an existential threat. Uh, uh, people have, have made uh, compromises to accept uh, vaccines that haven't been tried in the normal protocols in order to save the economy. I don't see why people would not accept geoengineering in order to save the economy again. Do you know, and uh, because and, and it, it, it will be sold the same way. Mm. You know? And there's been a great test with this uh, this situation that we have now. You know, so I, I would be really oh, concerned. I hope it's wrong. I, you see, I hope that it would be the breaking point where people would decide that the economy, if you have to choose between geoengineering and the economy, I think that that's the breaking point. I think the majority of people fall on the other side of, no, I, th I think that nobody's that crazy, apart from a few, maybe 25% are that crazy. But you, you, you know, the, the kind of crowd that says, well, look at the pandemic. It shows what we can do when we all pull together as one world. It's like, hang on, it was a fucking disaster. But they don't see that. <laughs> they, they think it was a huge success. So, so you, you know, two different worlds, people can have absolutely different points of view. But I think reality bites when nobody's dumb enough to do geoengineering unless they really are far gone. So it kind of separates the sheep from the goats, I think. It's a, it's a great dividing line. Well, unless anybody's got any more to say, then I think we should end it there because this was a long one. <laughs> oh, I th uh, okay. there was a thought I had earlier real quick. Um, so the situation with Faulty kind of reminds me of Eugene Debs, you know, that guy from America in the early 19th. So Eugene Je Debs was a socialist activist and they chucked him in prison for 10 years. <laughs> so when you talked about the crime bill with Faulty, remind reminded me of him. He was doing anti-imperialist activism and it was, um, uh, it, I think it was pre-Red Scare, some of those laws they chucked him, like the Anti-Sedition Act or something, they chucked him in prison for 10 years. They, they released him early, but uh, that was after the war went through and they did all their dirty shit and prevented him from running for president and all that. And then they released him early. But yeah, that kind of reminded me of mm. Faulty a little oh, bit. Yeah. And Eugene yeah, Jeff. They always seen... do it. It's, it's basically a sucker. They, they always do it. It's basically like a sucker and Vincetti, and Vincetti moment. They, you know, they, they, they executed, you know, sucker and Vin, uh, Vincetti. And they, 
they, they knew that they weren't guilty. They just executed them as an example. Yeah, yeah. So that that's the only other thing I wanted to say is probably we talked to Faulty about like those parallels of what happened to those guys and stuff so that he doesn't walk into the, the same mistake. Yeah. Okay. So should we end it there and basically should we just like pause before we go? And just whew, that was a long one, but but I thought we definitely nailed some very good points in this one. All right, so let's just give it all up. And just remember that it's all part of the theater done with the backdrop of the void. Remember that we're on Team Human. And in the end, it's all just a play of consciousness. To let go, give up on any results or outcome, fall still, and rest. Om Paramatmane Nama. Fabulous, guys. So much fun. <laughs> thanks. Right, you all have a Great, safe thank week. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, thanks, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Take care, right. everyone. Stay Take care, everyone. Sweet. Okay. Thank you.